Thank you, Amalia. So, uh, so I think this might be a little different than what the normal, uh, what normally happens at these these seminars. I'm going to try to keep this kind of pretty broad and uh, maybe on topic. So, uh, so f flu evolves very quickly, and that means we need to keep updating the va the vaccines that we're giving for it. So, if we look just over the last since uh, since '94 to, to today, actually, there's an update here that I'm missing now. Uh, we see that they've. The WHO has constantly recommended new strains to put into the, to put into the uh, yearly formulation, the flu vaccine. And so you can see that in, uh, so I have to use the pointer to, uh, to point rather than a, uh, a laser pointer. So we can see that in 93, there is a strain from Shandong that was actually discovered in 93, but then made it into the 95, uh, sorry, the 94, 95 flu vaccine. Then it was updated to Johannesburg, which was gathered in 94, but then used in the 95-96 uh, uh, season vaccine. So there's been these constant updatings. And so basically, every year, uh, folks need to get together at the WHO and decide, does an update need to occur? So that's kind of the first really big question. And then if an update needs to occur, which strain do we want to put into the vaccine? So I'm going to be kind of approaching this question from an evolutionary perspective and try to um, have a little insight here. So here we have the influenza virus. Uh, it has a lipid, lipid envelope stolen from the host cell. On the surface are uh, neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. Uh, hemagglutinin acts as kind of a, a grappling hook that when this floats by another a host cell, it will glom on and spill the single-stranded RNA inside. And that will make more infectious particles. And as the main, uh, this big sticky protein, this is the main target for the human immune response, and it's what the virus really needs to evolve. Uh, we've seen for flu that there's these repeated pandemics that are happening because even if we were able to kind of completely exterminate flu from the human population, it would just spill back over from this wild reservoir within birds and other animals. So we saw that in 1918, there was a uh, kind of flu, which is going to be called H1N1 because it's the first H, the first hemagglutin we saw, and the first neuraminidase that we saw, so H1N1. It spilled over into humans in 1918, caused this massive global pandemic, killed 50 million people. But then after that point, rather than just dying out, it was able to evolve year to year and keep infecting people with seasonal influenza. So then in 1957, there was a second introduction uh, of H2N2, so a different species of bird influenza that moved into humans, caused a smaller pandemic, but then there's some kind of immunity between these two strains. So then H2N2 basically knocked out H1N1. And we had H2N2 in the world until 1968, when H3N2 emerged, which was actually a, a reassortment event between human influenza, between H2N2 and bird H3, and a bird uh, H3. And this caused another pandemic that knocked out H2N2. This continued on until 1977, when there was what thought, when, uh, when a strain of H1N1 emerged that was genetically identical to the 1957 virus. And we're, we're almost certain this came out of a lab accident somewhere in probably Soviet Russia. But it's a, it's a human introduced reintroduction of this virus is, is certain. And because it, there was existing host immunity, this didn't cause such a bad pandemic and it ended up circulating alongside H3N2. Then the most recent thing in 2009, we had a whole different kind of a very evolutionary distinct H1N1 that emerged, uh, we'll call it pandemic H1N1, that kills off old H1N1. And today we're left with circulating H3N2 and new H1N1. I should, I should say, just interrupt me with questions if you, if you have any. Uh, so if we look at H3N2 uh, over time, we see that there's really fast evolution. So I've just gathered all the sequences I can from GenBank, and you're basically seeing kind of a histogram, where at this point there's uh, about 40% of the flu that's in GenBank is this one particular strain, but then there's a bunch of strains at low frequency. And you can see that just year to year that there's constant turnover and replacement of the virus population. What, what I find really interesting as an evolutionary biologist is that if I could go and take a kind of a random gene from a fruit fly and look at it over the course of a million years rather than 10 years, we'd get a very similar picture, the same sort of turnover in the uh, rate of evolution. So, so flu evolves very quickly. If we, we can look at this picture a different way, as kind of maybe a more classical way, as an evolutionary tree. And what you can see here then is that if we look, let's say in 2006, we have this diversity of the virus population, and we have a number of different viruses that are all around the world. And if we take them all and we 
look backwards, we find that it only takes until about, say, 2004 for them to find a common ancestor. And we get this kind of all along the tree, and that basically that even like if we think of today, there is someone in the world that's sick with H3 and 2 that in two years, all the flu in the world, or maybe three years, all the flu in the world would descend from that person. And this is, this is basically saying that there's a lot of uh, genetic differences among strains of flu in the world, and there'll be some strain that has an adaptive uh, variant to it, and it will quickly take over because it's that much better than other strains. And we think that all of this adaptation is basically played out on the, uh, the landscape of human immunity. So there are strains that are evolving to escape the existing immunity that we have. So I can get infected with a strain of flu as a child, and I'll be immune to that strain forever. But if a new strain evolves, then that will be able to infect me, and then that strain will have an advantage uh, to transmit. So looking at this tree then, if we're thinking about vaccination, we can see that it's evolving very quickly. But we'd basically be wanting to look at kind of, say, say we're in 2006, we'd have the choice of these different clades to vaccinate with. And we want to pick the right clade. We want to pick maybe this clade, the one that wins, rather than the ones that, that die out, like, uh, like this clade. Uh, however, so this is kind of this is this genetic perspective. The, uh, the WHO, and what's actually really central here, is that we have really good assays for uh, antigenic uh, phenotype in the virus. So you can kind of have an idea if a vi one strain of virus will elicit immunity that protects against other strains of viruses. And the kind of the statistics that I've been using here is called antigenic cartography. And I'll explain a bit about it. Uh, what these, these basic assays for flu are these uh, influenza hemagglutination inhibition assays, which I'll just call HI. So in a hemagglutination assay, you can tell whether there's a virus present by just you put some red blood cells in a well, they'll sink to the bottom. But if you put virus in with the red blood cells, then the virus will naturally bind to these salic acid receptors on the surface of the red blood cells. That will cause this kind of diffuse lattice. And so you have an assay for presence or absence of the virus. But then you can uh, make this an uh, inhibition assay by including uh, sera, by including antibodies. If these bind to the virus, that will prevent the virus from binding to the red blood cell, and you'll get back out a dot. So how this ends up looking is if you have something like this, and this is basically what the WHO is doing every year, is they'll take a, say, strain A of virus, this is blue virus, uh, a challenge a ferret with it, wait a couple weeks, draw blood from the ferret, centrifuge out the sera, then do a dilution series of that sera. So this is 1 to 40 concentration of ferret sera, 1 to 80, 1 to 160, 1 to 50, 120. And we can see that as we get all the way up to 1280, 1 to 1280, we get inhibition. So that these antibodies in the ferret, that ferret's immune system, are, uh, are strong enough to uh, inhibit binding of the virus. Whereas at 2560, we don't get binding anymore. So we would say here that the titer uh, for, uh, the titer for uh, virus A against sera, raised against A, is 1280. We'd say that uh, if we look at B versus sera from A, we'd also say it's 1280. So we'd, say, we'd think then that an infection with virus A would protect against reinfection by virus A, but it, protection by, infection by virus A would also protect against virus B. And we'd see the same thing with C and D to a lesser degree, whereas in E, F, and G, we get much lower titers. So we'd expect then that infection with A would not protect against E, F, and G, uh, but would protect against H. And so basically, at all of the strain selection meetings, uh, WHO folks are getting together and looking at tables something like this, where this is showing uh, the normal setup is you have a panel of reference viruses and reference sera. So these, these here are the same as these here. And this is now uh, Wisconsin 67 virus from 2005. And this is ferret 1 from 2006 that was infected by Wisconsin 67 2005. We can see it has a high titer to itself, but then low titers to viruses from 2009. So we'd expect then that, again, that infection with this 2005 virus would not provide very much protection against 2009 viruses. And then because it's expensive and, and uh, difficult to make all these ferret sera, uh, they only do that for this small panel of uh, test viruses. And then we'll look at, sorry, of reference viruses. And then we'll look at a number of different test viruses as well, which only show up as, as viruses, as rows in the table, and not as columns. And so this, this basic uh, approach has been used since the 70s. And it's been the kind of basis for how the WHO chooses vaccine strains. However, they've, they kind of have a problem now in that they're generating lots and lots of data. 
and it's hard to kind of uh, you know, look at 100 of these tables and make any sense out of them if, you, if you're sitting at the meeting. So in the data set that I'm, I'm looking at at the moment, I have uh, 27,000 HI measurements over the course of 1968 to 2011. And I, I could not look at that just by eye. And the idea then is to use some statistics to try to uh, leverage this and understand what's going on a bit better. And so uh, this is where the antigenic cartography comes in. The idea is that you have some uh, pairs of distances. So we compare uh, blue or purple versus orange and purple versus blue. And we know that these are this far apart and these are this far apart. And then we can try to kind of put things on a map and orient them so that the, they connect better and that you can see that this distance here and this distance here are, are recapitulated in the pairwise distances. So when this is done with the, the flu HI data, uh, there was this really nice result um, in 2004 that you see kind of this clustered or punctuated evolution where there looks like there's this cluster of viruses that are all similar to each other that were circulating around 1968. And then there was a evolutionary jump to set viruses that were circulating in 72 and on in 75 and so forth. I'll go over this pattern a bit more. So how this basically works uh, in a bit more detail is that there's uh, these, let's say we have red virus, blue virus, yellow virus, and now this is sera raised against uh, red virus, sera raised against blue virus. We can see the titers high from A versus A, uh, and it drops from A to B and A to C. And so what you can see here then is that if we look at the t uh, here, the sera versus A, that we have one unit of distance from uh, the sera from A to virus A, and three units of distance to, uh, to virus B and virus C. And so each of these units is equivalent to a drop in titer. And you can then basically see that on the map then, that, uh, that sera from A and virus A are close to each other on the map, and sera from B and virus B are close to each other on the map. And you can kind of just look at the map and see is how similar are viruses just based upon their kind of physical distance. Um, math that I'm going to, to kind of skip. The idea here is that this is all a likelihood model, and you can have a probability of observing HI data, and then you can fit this model. And we fit this model through a technique called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which is the basic idea is you start with kind of some random parameters, and then you let the algorithm kind of tune itself and discover what parameters are actually realistic. Uh, this is all publicly available and implemented in this, this software package here, BEAST. So uh, in terms of results, if we, uh, one thing that's kind of at issue here is how many dimensions to use. So in the cartography, you could imagine one dimension or two dimensions like a, like a map or three dimensions uh, of kind of being able to place viruses. And so what I did here is I showed that if, if I collect data, I, collect, I take 90% of my data, and then try to predict titers in the remaining 10%, I see that two dimensions actually works better than three, four, or five dimensions. And so with three dimensions or more, you get this overfitting problem, which is kind of a classic statistical problem. And so it suggests then that the two-dimensional fit is, is uh, optimal or uh, as good as we're going to get here. And uh, here's the sort of uh, picture I get where uh, this is similar to before. Uh, here on the left side, I have viruses from 1968. And here on the right side, I have viruses from 2011 as the, uh, the colored circles. The gray circles are different uh, ferrets or different uh, sera locations. If I just plot this out now, so what was here before in dimension one uh, on the x-axis, I'm just putting this on the y and doing this versus time. So now you can see kind of how evolution is happening over time. And what you get is you get these interesting kind of stair-step patterns where there was this jump here in around 93 to this new virus that doesn't, and you don't get a lot of evolution. Then there's a jump uh, here in 95 not a lot of evolution, and so forth. And so what's really interesting for the, the WHO is uh, when these jumps are occurring and being able to kind of uh, recognize them quickly. So how this, this strain selection process works is basically there, it's this kind of really amazing system that's taken a lot of time to put into place. There are national influenza centers all throughout the world, and they're basically taking and doing the, the virological isolations from people coming in and presenting with flu these are then mailed to collaborating centers. Uh, there's five of them in uh, Atlanta, London, uh, Beijing, Tokyo, and Melbourne. And they actually do the uh, sequencing and HI uh, analysis. They have the ferrets at the, the collaborating centers. And the timeline is basically that 
uh, up to up to maybe January-ish. There are viruses being isolated by the National Influ Influenza Centers. They're then uh, mailed into the collaborating centers, which are characterized up until the week before the strain selection meeting at the end of February. The strain selection meeting happens. They pick a strain. And then it takes a little while to get, to get that uh, into, into proper, able to be used as a vaccine. So first off, they need to select for high growth reassortance so they can just grow up enough vaccine. Uh, it's still done in chicken eggs, amazingly. Uh, then this manufacture process takes a, a while. Uh, licensure, packaging, distribution, and we finally get vaccination around October. So now let's, let's say that um, I'm just going to kind of uh, try to put things a little more concretely. Let's say we're trying to pick the vaccine for the 2006-2007 winter season in the Northern Hemisphere. So that means that we're having a strain selection meeting in February of 2006, and we basically have viruses up through 2005, maybe a few viruses from January 2006, but basically viruses from 2005. This is the sort of picture that the cartography gives uh, in February 2006. So each gray dot is a virus that has been collected and uh, assayed antigenically. The, uh, the colored dots are previous vaccine strains. We can see that we went from Shandong 93 to Johannesburg to Wuhan to, uh, to Moscow to Sydney, uh, sorry, to Sydney to Moscow to Fujian 02 uh, to California 704. And so now the question is, is it looks like there's some viruses over here that are, that are new and whether we should update. The WHO generally considers that a fourfold difference in HI titer is sufficient to, uh, to update the, the vaccine. And so this is uh, 220 to around 23, 22. So it looks like we have that criteria. Uh, if we look forward, the WHO actually chose this strain, chose Wisconsin 67 from 2005, which is right here on the map. And so you can kind of see that, that progression. Then if we go forward a year and see, see how good they did, now I include new data. So these strains that are dark gray are strains that were actually circulating in the winter of 2006, 2007. And the red square is the centroid, is the center of mass of those strains. So the best possible vaccine would be basically where this red square is. It's going to kind of cover the circulating strains as best as possible. And we can see that Wisconsin 67 is actually a pretty, a pretty good choice. Could have, you know, they could have fixed something over here. Uh, so this looks like a pretty good year. We can kind of assess that in a bit more detail by uh, looking at this is, the, uh, this is basically the distance of each of these gray dots that were circulating in 2005 to the red square, to the center. And we see that Wisconsin 67 is a, a pretty good choice. There might be a, a couple that were maybe better, but it's going to be hard to tell with, with the noise that we actually have. And we see that it's, it is two units better than, um, than California 07, 2004. So this was a definite improvement over the, if they would have stuck with the same vaccine. So, uh, so now I'd like to kind of approach this similar question. And the idea is that we want to predict which strain to use. I'm gonna just do a bit of statistics. So, uh, so I'm gonna use a Kalman filter, which I don't expect you to have heard of. Um, they were basically used, uh, first developed for the Apollo moon missions, and then found a lot of use as in ballistic missile technology. Uh, and now you might use the, you kind of every day are encountering them in your phone, where the idea is that the phone is pinging to GPS and it says, I'm, it seems like I am here, but to get that blue dot on your phone that doesn't just like flash here and flash here and flash here, you need a, the phone actually has within it a dynamical model of where it thinks it is, uh, how precise it knows its location, how quickly it thinks it's moving in any direction and its acceleration in these directions. And so without that, call, without that, that model, you'd get these, say, the phone's in a car driving down second, you'd get these pings that are updating. Whereas with the common filter, the idea is that the phone knows where it is and is updating its location and its velocity by the GPS pings, uh, something like this. The algorithm is actually really simple. It's kind of, it's very, it's, it's beautiful. So we get a, a predict step. So we just, uh, using the current location and the, uh, the current estimated location, the current estimated velocity, you can project forward in X amount of time where the, where the phone will be. Then you update that by a, by a ping. So that will then correct it down. The, the, these gray uh, circles are kind of how much uncertainty we have. So we see that uncertainty has increased. 
when we project forward, our uncertainty increases, but then when we get the GPS ping, uncertainty shrinks. And so then the, the filter basically gives an idea of uh, each kind of small step in time where we think the, the phone is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take that, that, this exact model that I was showing you and apply it to the, the flu data. So the idea is that there is a center of mass of the flu population. And we don't know exactly where that is because it's random where we're, to some extent, where we're observing these viruses. There's noise here. And so that's this, this black dot is the uh, estimated center. The gray, or the gray circle is the uh, amount of uncertainty we have in that center. And the black line is a trace of where we think it is. And so as we go forward at the beginning, it takes a little while to kind of get set up. But then you can see that it tracks the virus population pretty well. And there are these times like, yeah, so over here in around 2001, there's not a lot of data. Uh, there wasn't very much H3 circulating at the moment. So we don't really know where the virus, where the population is. But once we get start getting more data in 2002, we have a much more precise idea about where the, where the population is. And you can see then that it, it tracks it uh, pretty nicely, and including these kind of bits of stutters and like this, this jump here that happened uh, in 2000. Uh, 10 right here where it kind of moves more quickly So what it's now very simple when this is in place to kind of just put a a one-year look ahead So if we just project forward using the uh, known velocity or the estimated velocity vector We can predict where flu is in a year's time So now that's this this red dot is projecting forward where we think the virus population will be uh, compared to the date that's up there and basically you can see that the, uh, the degree to which the black line and the red line overlap is telling you how good of a fit we're, we're doing. And so it looks, for the most part, uh, uh, pretty tight. Uh, if, we, if we look at it here, this is now showing, say, in 2005, the gray dots are the viruses that are coming up. The black line is the inferred location in 2005. And the red line is where we'd infer it to be uh, back a year in 2004. And so again, the proportion that the red and black lines overlap is saying kind of how good of a job we're doing. And it looks like after this initial period where kind of there's model fit going on, uh, things are looking pretty good in the last few years. So, uh, so we can use this then in a kind of very simple fashion that if we can project forward where we think the population will be. So this is coming back now. We're at this uh, February 2006 meeting. And, we want to and so we think then at the moment that this is the center of the current virus population. But come uh, winter of... Uh, say December 2006, this is where we think the virus population will be. So that would suggest then that we should pick one of these gray strains that is right, right around there as the, as the vaccine strain. So, yeah, please. So you know, we historically talk about antigenic shift and antigenic drift with respect to flu. And do you have enough data that says basically that this overcomes those distinctions? Or if mm -hmm. it's a left turn onto Yesler Way or whatever? Yes. Yes. So okay, so I'm supposed to re supposed to repeat the questions uh, for the TV. So uh, so the question is about antigenic drift and antigenic shift, and whether we can predict kind of if the virus population were to to veer off in, in some other direction. And well, so first off, this isn't saying like what I'm used to. The most classical distinction there is the shift is occurring with these like H2, H3, H whatever as this completely new thing that humans have never seen before jumping in. And that's going to be different enough that it just completely pushes everything else out. Whereas this drift is like this yearly kind of incremental changes. Uh, however, even the drift can kind of veer a bit and can be difficult to, to really um, pin down. So one example, yeah, one, ex uh, one example is here where, in, where the model is definitely not doing as well, where it kind of, so you can see that it was, it was coming uh, kind of south, uh, southeast, but then we get these viruses that are appearing that are kind of north. And so it takes a second for it to, you can even see it better over here. Uh, it takes a second for that to correct, or not a second, it takes a, a few months for that to correct. Uh, where it's projecting it will keep going southeast, but then now these virus strains are starting to appear north of things, up the page, and it takes a little while. Uh, yeah, it takes from, let's see, it takes from like uh, June-ish to uh, September-ish for it to, to correct for that. Yes? I mean, to, to get to your question, it happened monitoring the virus in other populations like, say, in pigs. Oh, yes. And if you went, if you, with, the, with the 2009 pandemic, if you go 
go back, you know, we, we've been following the pig evolution of the virus in the pigs over the last five or 10 years, which is a very interesting study to do, and then overlay the model because you might actually predict when you're going to get a, when you're going to get a, 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 a shift in sure. the virus population, but it requires a number of things. So, so there's, there's really interesting stuff with the, the animal What's in the animal populations, things are happening very differently. So flu, it's, so pigs are killed um, quickly en enough that uh, build of immunity is not as important for the pig flu viruses, where they're not going to gain the same selective advantage by being able to reinfect. So if you look at, uh, there's this really interesting case where an H3 virus moved from humans into pigs, like the same H3 virus at around uh, 1973, moved from humans into pigs, and then they went on parallel courses of evolution from 73 to present. And this, the pig viruses uh, basically evolved five times slower than the human viruses. They kept evolving genetically, but we saw much slower antigenic drift. And so, which, which actually seems like it would make the surveillance easier, that you could, you could kind of have a pretty good idea of what the, of all the different kinds of antigenic variants that are in the, the pig population at, a mom at any moment. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, doesn't your vaccine also put population pressure on the viruses too? Can't uh, you use that information to update your prediction? So, because yeah. Because are going to be basically repulsed by... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there, there's a few things going on, on here. Uh, uh, well, w one is that the... Uh, that that there's, there's kind of a... a issue with original antige antigenic sin in the vac vaccination so that I will, if I'm vaccinated this year, or I, even if I get the flu this year, uh, rather than making a, a really good, strong, new, durable response to uh, 2014 viruses, I will just really boost up my antibodies to some viruses from the 1980s. And so, so there's uh, kind of a loss of, of efficacy that way. You'd have more kind of a stronger pressure by vaccinating children before they've ever seen the virus. So that's, that's one thing. And this is part of the reason, almost certainly a large component of the reason why flu vaccine is 40%, 50% effective rather than, because the match is actually often quite, quite good. And even when the match is quite good, it, it will be 60% effective. And that's, um, I don't know if everyone would agree with me here, but I think a lot of people would agree with me that that's this, this ant boosting of uh, previous antibodies. Uh, the second issue, and probably a bigger issue, is that um, I have a slide uh, that viruses from uh, uh, East and Southeast Asia, from mainly China and India, are actually composing the the source population in in H3. So that generally any evolution that happens within temperate regions doesn't go anywhere. And so what you'd expect then that even if there's vaccine pressure, say in the USA or Europe, that that won't have lasting impacts. But that if, if China were to implement some large scale vaccination policy, which they don't really have at the moment, if they were, then we could start to maybe see some feedback under the, under the virus population. Uh, but at the moment, basically, I don't, I don't think anyone really thinks that there's much uh, vaccine pressure and evolution. It's something that's, that's not completely clear, but the, the consensus would be there's, there's not a lot of of what we're doing right now is not having a lot of pressure. Okay, so so I'm going to make a prediction of uh, that I should that a virus that's near to this red dot, which is our projected forward in uh, the winter of 2006 2007, of we should pick one of these viruses. So we want to pick one of these gray viruses here, um, and now I'm going to kind of so that's the example case. Uh, maybe this is out of order. Uh, I I'm going to now walk through each year and show how I would do compared to WHO. So in, let's say we're now in February 2003, we get a choice of, 2000, of any virus up to 2002, up through 2002, and we're going to use this virus for the 2003-2004 season. In this case, the WHO stuck with the virus that they've been using for a while, Moscow 10 from 99. And so I would predict that that virus here, this is a look ahead prediction is going to be four ish units away from the center of the population. And then that there are all these other viruses from 2002 that would be better to use. But then I would predict to use this, this virus from Guam, uh, 228 2002, as the best case. 
Uh, and you can see then if we look a year in a year's time and we look to see how that well that did, that basically if this line was kind of this perfect diagonal, that would mean that the prediction is, is perfect. And we, you know, we knew exactly what was going to happen, whereas any scatter here is, is, uh, is either noise from the assay or, no or viruses veering in a direction that we didn't predict. But we can see here that this choice of Guam 228 is, is kind of is much better than what the WHO picked. And it's better than 90% of strains from 2002. They, they should have updated it in, 2000, in 2002. And I've, um, I've spoken with people that say that there was an issue with like, having the proper uh, high growth reassortant. And they, were, like, they wanted an update, but they, but they couldn't do it. So, so it's maybe not completely fair to say that they, that they didn't do a good job here. Uh, so if we look in 2003, so now so we we're in February 2004, we have a choice of 2003 viruses. Uh, the WHO in this year updated to Fujian 411 uh, from 2002. And I would say instead to use Brisbane 7 from 2003. We didn't see that Brisbane 7 is projected to be a little bit better and was a little bit better, but for the most part, it's, it's fairly comparable to the WHO choice. It has a one unit improvement. And, uh, and Brisbane 07 is better than 83% of strains from, from 2003. If we look, uh, if we look in uh, one year forward, uh, the, in this case, uh, WHO chose to update to California 7 from 2004. And so now this is, you can see, uh, this is the population has evolved forward. So here's the green dot is in the same, is now kind of back from where the population is. Uh, and we see California 7. In this case, this is maybe not the best case for the model, where I would have predicted that Christchurch uh, 280 is a much better choice, uh, whereas, in fact, it was only a, a slightly better choice. If we go forward again to 2005, uh, in this year, the WHO would have picked Wisconsin 67 from 2005. I actually pick Wisconsin 67 from, the WHO did pick Wisconsin 67. I, I picked Wisconsin 67. This is a good choice. It's better than 91% of strains from 2005. Uh, when we go forward a year, in this case, uh, this is one of the other kind of mismatches. Uh, here, the WHO stuck with uh, Wisconsin 67. Uh, but here, it, looks, it really looked to me that there's a lot of viruses that are now going to be better than this. And I would pick this uh, Yangnam uh, strain, uh, Korean strain uh, from 2006. And we see then that's. Uh, substantial improvement of the WHO choice. So this would be, this would be something that I'd, I'd really maybe point to. Uh, and then in 2007 viruses, the WHO chose to update to Brisbane. This seemed kind of maybe like a funny choice. We can, should do a little, be able to do a little bit better than that uh, in 2008. And in 2009, it looks like we can do a little bit better than the Perth choice as well. So overall, we see that uh, there's an improvement in eight out of nine cases uh, with this, this method. Get the same, uh, the same choice in one case. Uh, we'd avoid two mismatches, which are the kind of really things that the WHO is trying to avoid, where there's, there's an actual fairly strong more than two unit mismatch between the vaccine strain and the uh, and circulating strains. Uh, and it's just some like super back of the envelope calculations that take with a lot, of, a lot of salt, that the average improvement of the model here is 1.7 HI units, very roughly from, um, from kind of challenge studies and vaccine work. We think that one unit of HI mismatch is about 5 or 10% vaccine efficacy. So we'd expect maybe by using these, these sorts of strains, we'd get 8 to 16% improvement in VE. And even a very, because there's just so many people vaccinated for flu, if we had just a small improvement of VE, say, in, uh, say an 8% improvement, we'd expect hundreds of thousands of cases averted in the US and many more over the world. Just, so this is, yeah, this is not to say the WHO choices are bad, but even if we could eke out a little bit more of VE, we could, we could really improve things here. So when the WHO mm. choice was as far to the left and the bottom in a given year, did that year flu, like the most vaccinated people, correlate with better protection, better predictive? So, so there's a number of studies on this that that it's that's basically these kind of meta analyses of so every year there's uh, there's studies of the of vaccine efficacy and every year we know about about these cases or, or about kind of a general uh, kind of actually how well did the WHO strain match the circulating population 
and there there is a correlation, but it's not it's not super super strong. And I don't know why. I, I, maybe I should revisit some of that. But the the yeah the published studies I've I've seen have definitely have a correlation between antigenic match and and VE, but it's it's not as it's not as as really strong as as I would have maybe would have even expected. So if you picked where your X is the X seems strange. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, so I think in many cases, these, like uh, this, right, this, yeah, this sort of thing, this could all be noise. Um, it could be, it, it, uh, this could all be noise. It could, there could, it could be real. We expect that there's not, that there's not actually all this many strains of flu circulating. There's probably a few dots here that are the actual distinct antigenic variants of flu circulating, and all of this gray kind of um, uh, uncertainty we have here is just, is just noise. And so it could be that, that these are ident that Brisbane 7 and Fujian, um, Fujian 411 are identical, unclear. But, but I'm, I'd be pretty confident that this, this, is, this is an actual difference. Yes? Sorry, say say that again. So could you use the relative prevalence of each strain as isolated by the centers to guide information on the next and give them more weight? I oh, I see. There are more accurate GPS coordinates, so you can yes. that more than the one-off that says your opportunity is not. Yes, oh, well, absolutely. So there, yeah, there's two things going on here. So this is my live version of what flu looks like in the world at the moment. And if we, if we look at, at these clades here, we'd expect that we see these maybe three-ish major clades, and so you, you would want to weight them appropriately by how many viruses are, are in that, that clade. And this is kind of like these, these dots that, that I had where you'd really want to weight by the center of mass of everything, and if there's one virus that, one strain that has a lot of a high prevalence, then you, you should weight that more heavily. Um, actually, I should come back to this. Uh, so how, how I'd, I'd see that then is that yeah, that this kind of should be naturally doing it, doing it here, where uh, if, if kind of the gray dots stack up in one place, you should be, you should be capturing that. Uh, there's a second issue that, that I think is, is real and important, and I'm not doing an okay job at it, but not maybe as ideal as I'd want to, is that there are strains that we really know the location quite well because they're a reference. So there's this big dichotomy be between there's a handful, maybe, um, three a year uh, of reference strains, and we know those locations quite well on the map. And all of the vaccine strains are reference strains, but there's some other reference, reference viruses, whereas the other viruses we don't, we don't know as well. And so that this dot here could be there, or it could be over here, it could be over here, and we don't, we don't have a good idea of that. So what I'm, what I'm doing in, in this analysis is that I actually, uh, in the antigenic cartography technique, uh, it will produce posterior uh, samples. So it's kind of, you can make, take snapshots of we think, this is where we think the viruses are, this is where we think the viruses are, and that will give you the level of uncertainty. So out of a thousand of these snapshots, in each snapshot I run the Kalman filter, and then, then I get an, an estimate of how good the match is over the course of those, uh, so I wasn't going to show this slide, but we will, um, of those, of those snapshots. And so we can see then that there are some strains that are more characterized than others. So this strain here, this is now distance, predicted distance of the center of the population to that strain. And we see that this has a lower error bar. We're more certain of this strain's location than this strain's location. So this is going to be a strain that we have more HI data for than this strain. And so I actually pick the virus not that has the, uh, the uh, mean that's closest, but that over the course of all of these snapshots, it's the, <laughs> it's it's always always decently close. So I'm I'm trying to do that at least. Okay, so we could improve upon the WHO choices quite possibly. The other nice thing here is that that there's a lot of importance to when we should update the vaccine because we can actually there's a lot of cost involved in in making these updates. And also, 
there are kind of other factors coming into play, like EGA adaptation, where there, even though we've we've chosen a good a good antigenic match to the to the virus, in growing up in eggs, the virus will undergo kind of these canonical mutations to better bind to the egg sialic acid receptors, and this can have antigenic repercussions. This was actually a problem in the last uh, in the last vaccine strains that we had, or the, in this year's vaccine strain, uh, and so. So it can be that updating would have on if you even if you could conceivably get a better antigenic match, you have to avoid these these sorts of things as well. So often it's not it's not better to update. What I would kind of push here is that this gives us this you really want to read out for how how much of an improvement of vaccine efficacy could we hope to make? And so this is this is what you'd want to be able to tell the WHO is that uh, if we update, we can improve VE by five percent or we could not update. And then the cost benefit can be can be weighed, but right now it's it's kind of hazy whether or not there's a, a match or or a mismatch. So this is the the basic results. There are kind of a, a few different ways that I thought that we could maybe improve things. Uh, one is that we could have a better kind of dynamical model. So the model that I was using in this this Kalman filter is this really kind of stupid um, phone in a car sort of model, where where there's no biology, uh, and you could imagine something that. That one thing that I was thinking of is uh, is Fisher's fundamental theorem, which is this uh, uh, fundamental theorem about uh, natural selection that basically says that selection will go up the kind of a gradient towards higher fitness at a rate equal to that that slope. And so we'd expect then that if there's variation in the population along some gradient, that we'd get more evolution along that that gradient. So so I could imagine basically dynamical models that that better capture uh, evolution. Uh, a big thing, though, is other, including other data sources. So we, we have this HI data, but we also have sequence data, and we have uh, epidemiological surveillance data, and we have uh, um, geography. And I'll, I'll come back to geography. And the other thing is improving the estimation of, of antigenic phenotype. So the more noise we can get out of and kind of remove from the estimations of these, point, these virus locations, the better job we could do. So in terms of uh, migration, so coming back to this, um, maybe give it, do spend a little bit more time here, that if you, so this is showing the same tree that, that you saw before, going from 2000 to 2012. We see that there's rapid replacement of strains from all over the world, and that generally there's a lot of mixing. But you can, you can still see that there's geographic segregation. So for instance, from 2000 to 2002, there was this clade here, that is showing up mostly within China, a bit in Japan, a bit in Southeast Asia. And there's this other clade here that's showing up in South America, in, uh, in Oceania, in the USA, back in South America. And so there's these kind of, there's this temperate clade and this uh, 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 Southeast Asian clade. And then we see that eventually this temperate clade dies out after leaving a few progeny in India that die out, and this other clade wins. And so you can think of it as that there's this person that's sick with flu somewhere in the world that will kind of spawn the entire infection. And that person we think is actually likely right now to be within China or India. And part of this is, uh, is almost certainly uh, just number of people. But uh, a bigger thing, or, and, and also a really big part, point, is the seasonality. So flu will drop down to basically no infections in the summertime in the USA. So that makes it so that for someone in the USA to kind of seed future uh, influence of population, flu has to get into the USA, get into that person, and then get back out of the USA into, into, the, into the southern hemisphere or into the uh, equatorial region before the end of the flu season. And so this kind of this, this process is, is less likely to happen than this more reservoir population, which is circulating year round within uh, India and China. And so if we actually can kind of estimate through uh, statistically along the trunk of this tree. So this is looking now at this branch here. And it's showing here that we expect that, uh, that we're pretty confident that in around 2001 that that branch, that trunk of the tree, is it within North China. We think then it's in South China, but we're pretty sure it's in either North or South China uh, between 2000 and 2003. Then in Southeast Asia, uh, in this late 2003, back to South China, to India, back to Southeast Asia, probably pass, passes through the USA briefly in 2008, but for the most part showing up in, in uh, China and, South, and India. 
So it suggests then that we could, that in these kind of doing these filters or doing these predictions, that we really would want to be giving more weight to the uh, to the strains from uh, from India or from China. Uh, there's an interesting kind of follow-on from from this effect, where that if you look at antigenic uh, displacement, so this is saying. Uh, if we look at this kind of curve of, or the, the cloud of viruses that are moving forward on the map, we can see then that viruses in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, and the USA are generally ahead of the curve, whereas viruses, especially in uh, South America, are, are behind the curve. And so this is, this is again suggesting that, that uh, picking these, that picking these uh, Chinese or Indian viruses would kind of give a, a bit of a a head start to where the, the virus population is going. And the WHO definitely is, is cognizant of this. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing here and what I've been, been working a fair amount on is trying to more uh, deeply connect the, epidemi the antigenic evolution with the genetic evolution. So in one model here, I have a phylogeny of H3 and 2 virus sequences from 68 to 2011. And you can see just as before that there's this pronounced trunk branch and these short side branches. And I'm going to apply this model that was developed by uh, uh, colleagues basically to deal with uh, phylogeography. So the idea is that you have latitude and longitude that are drifting over the course of the phylogeny, and you can try to reconstruct from this where the internal nodes are. And what I do is I just apply that latitude and longitude model to, uh, to the antigenic map. And so that basically takes each of the viruses that were before just a point, and it connects them with their evolutionary tree. So you can see here that this clade of viruses here, or this group of viruses here, is one evolutionary clade. So there's one mutation that went from these, this type of virus over to here, and then we get some maybe a bit of diversification within that clade. And you can more easily see then that for the most part, the virus is kind of just jumping from one to the next rather than uh, splitting. So we get a couple splits in 77 and in 90. Uh, 89, where then this other clade takes over. And you can also see here that including the, the tree kind of tightens things up a bit, where this is a little bit tighter than, than this. Uh, and so we get kind of a better inference of these locations. So the goal that, that I'm working towards at the moment is a, like I want a server that is going in and pulling all the publicly available data for both HI and for sequences, and then saying basically where flu is at this very moment and where we think it's going. Uh, what, what, I have, what I have now is this is, this is flu up to, up to today. I think the last sequence is in here, or maybe last week. Uh, the, uh, and back to 2010 and so on. The blue dots are viruses that are more than a year old. These yellow dots are viruses that are uh, between 12 and 8 months old. Orange dots are between 8 and 4 months, and, yellow, and red dots are within the last 4 months. So you can see that it's these viruses that are currently circulating and currently around. All of these viruses have died out. And the idea, and then each of the green dots is the WHO vaccine choices. There's this interesting bit so that if we look, we go back here, that in February 2012, they chose uh, Victoria 361 2011 as the vaccine strain. And this. Uh, and this is actually a very good choice. So we can see that there are these two clades. There's actually a whole bunch of these viruses that are circulating, but they chose this little minor clade. But we can see that that was kind of taking off, that this minor clade was taking off. They chose those viruses. And if we go forward just a year into that winter, uh, they chose well. That almost all of the viruses that are around that winter descend from the tr that clade that they chose. There's a few circulating still from this old clade, but they, they did a very good job. However, what's kind of weird, and so then this virus had these problems with the egg adaptation that I was talking about. But then if we go forward, uh, they updated then. Uh, this is now this year's flu vaccine was chosen then in February 2014. And they actually chose this Texas virus, 50, 2012. They chose this virus to be purposefully antigenically identical to Victoria 361 and not have the problem with egg adaptation. It, it felt, I don't. I don't quite understand exactly like it. I don't, I don't want to criticize too much. Uh, I, I don't understand why there's a lot of evolution that's gone on past this. All the problems with vaccine update are present and moving to Texas 50. But yeah, so 
So it's weird. Uh, and something from these probably should have been chosen. Actually, for the southern hemisphere strain that was just chosen last week, they picked uh, Switzerland, uh, 9715, blah, 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 uh, from 2013. And that is from these, these advanced clades. So um, my, I would suspect that this year won't be as good of a match as some other years. Um, but the, yeah, so the idea is to take this and basically build in the rest of the pipeline and be able to kind of have a snapshot of looking today, what strain would we want to choose for the, the flu vaccine? Uh, and with that, I, I should close. Um, thanking data sources, especially John McCauley at, uh, at the WHO Collaborating Center in London has been really great about sharing HI data. Uh, and collaborators, especially Andrew Rambo and Mark Suchard. Uh, with that, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, so so I don't think there's not the same. At this point, I, I highly doubt that Ebola is actually evolving and competing in the same way that flu is here, that there's a strain that's kind of, oops, um, a strain that's out competing these other strains and is going to take off, that the genetic changes that we're seeing at the moment are going to be just tracking the transmission trees that are going on. However, it would like something like this that would basically, if, if we could get everyone on board to actually putting their sequence data up, which is not happening, uh, then, then we could have, have a, a, a daily idea of how, the, of how the virus is doing and maybe identify clades that are really, that are taking off. Because the thing will be if they're going to be introducing all these different vaccines. Yes. some studyable way in that. I see. You know, Ren, you're going to have the opportunity to see what the effect of the vaccine might be on the... Yep. Yeah. So I, I don't, I have no idea whether, or I, I would suspect that there wouldn't be uh, much opportunity. So there's kind of, there's one introduction into human population. And so any antigenic diversity that occurs will have to kind of grow out of that. I would, I would guess that, that, that it would be pretty homogenous with, with vaccination, that if, if the vaccine works on one strain, it will work on, on all the circulating strains. It's not, that's not certain, but, but the same sort of, so the same sort of kind of tighter data uh, cartography analysis can be done with things that aren't flu, with any like neutralization assay would work as well. I've, I've seen it used with dengue and, and so forth. And you could, you could look at this antigenic variability with, with that sort of approach. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the common filter, which I also have mm. not heard about before, but I, it seemed like the prediction, you want to use all current data mm -hmm. up until that point and project, project to your head, but it seemed like if you maybe updated it less frequently, that you might actually track better. Is, that, is there any plausibility to that? I see. So, so there's uh, something I, I completely glossed over or skipped, is that there, in the common folder, there are two parameters for, um, that, that are actually tunable. So one is, is how much noise, uh, uh, measurement noise there is. So in the phone case, it's how inaccurate the GPS pings are. And that's fairly easy to, to parameterize in this case. It's basically how far off the center of the population is from a random virus that you choose. And that's going to depend upon HI noise as well as actual population variability. And the other thing is how much, how quickly does the filter, or when a new ping comes in, does it just jump right to where that ping is, or does it stay, stay put? And so this is this process noise parameter, and that's, that's tunable as well. And so I, tune, I tuned that to give the best possible one-year look-ahead predict, predictions. Okay. So, so it doesn't. You did take, you did take yes. that into account. How quickly should I be moving? Yes. And you optimize the, the proximity of the prediction to the current data. Yes. Yeah. And, that, and that ends up being on this kind of yearly sort of for, forget everything a year, more than a year back is, is basically what that parameter says. And I see that you achieved predictions that were better than what other people were doing. It just wasn't clear how you did that. <laughs> yes. that. Yes, Noah? Do your models imply anything about possible changes to the laboratory component in the HI testing, like mm. more ferrets or more test strains? That's a good I question. Mean, there, can you identify a parameter yeah. that would be likely to reduce the noise of the system? So, so for me, and this is what Derek Smith would, I'm pretty sure, would say the same thing, is uh, at the moment, the, it's really, 
uh, common for the uh, the collaborating centers to because they're they're interested in just has the virus evolved has it has it changed from antigenically from last year and so what they'll do is they'll just include a handful of strains as these uh, these um, uh, reference viruses and they drop them fairly quickly and so often 2005 won't even be used and this in the map actually makes it hard to kind of scaffold things accurately so you can't get very long-range interactions and so it actually be for the cartography it'd be really helpful to have a 92 virus in here as well and you'd know if it's kind of looped around a bit and this is this is an issue for H3 but even more of an issue for for flu B whereas if they so it's maybe not as uh, immediately helpful for has the virus evolved but would kind of build a better global picture of the of the virus evolution if we had these more uh, longer range reference strains basically there's been a lot of talk about universal flu vaccine that's a good question so I think the so so there's a question of whether so this is often kind of dichotomized into thinking about antibodies to the head of the hemagglutinin, hemagglutinin protein and antibodies to the stem of the protein. And so that uh, the head is where it's currently evolving very quickly and natural antibodies raise. If you look within someone, you'll find a rare antibody that targets the, the stem. And so Polizzi, Peter Polizzi has been doing a lot of work where you try to make a, a virus that is just stem. And that then if you uh, vaccinate with that, if you immun immunogenize with that, then you should only really target uh, these stem antibodies, and maybe it, it will work there. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I think I think it has it has promise, but it's not. Nothing is like really fixed at the at the moment. There's there's strange things here where we you do get kind of uh, uh, stimulation of these broadly reactive antibodies, but you'd expect, and this is this is kind of a big mystery that. Uh, someone will get flu every 10 years throughout their lives. And so the head parts of the, these very variable epitopes are going to mutate every, during those 10 years, and those will have changed. So you get new antibodies there, but to conserve regions, you really should be boosting up these old antibodies. So that the way that flu is evolving, you really should expect that by the time someone's 50, they would have, by themselves, without a universal flu vaccine, have developed antibodies that target the stem non-evolving regions very well. And why we don't, why people that are 50 don't have broadly neutralizing antibodies is, is a mystery.